Alrighty, so as folks are getting settled, we'll go ahead and start with the second portion of today's College Safety Lunch and Learn. Thank you all for being here. Um, thank you, Mr. Volano, for helping us set this all up. Thank you all for wanting to engage with this. Thank you, Tisha, um, for a wonderful conversation on what the red zone is, how to protect ourselves from sexual assault. Um, men, women, students, faculty, right, everybody that is here on this campus. My name is Joshua Webb. I get to work for an organization called Crime Stoppers of Houston. Um, has anybody heard of Crime Stoppers? Quick show of hands. Okay. Most of us have at least heard of Crime Stoppers. Um, so I am programs coordinator at Crime Stoppers. I split my time between our safe school and safe community team. So I do a lot of presentations for students really as young as pre-K, talking about bullying and mental health and cyber safety, but also talking to high schoolers about active shooter preparedness, cyber safety, talking to educators about how to spot signs of child abuse and human trafficking. So a lot of my job is really community education. If y'all have any questions following today's presentation, my email address is up there on the screen, jweb at crime-stoppers.org. Also scanning that QR code will take you to our electronic business uh, card. It's a page called Hi Hello. On that page you'll find, of course, my email address, but a link to the Crime Stoppers Resource Center on our website. Our resource center has safety tips, blog posts, videos on all the different topics that we talk about at Crime Stoppers of Houston. So our mission as an organization is twofold, right? Solving crime and preventing crime. We solve crime with our tip line that I will talk about at the end of the presentation, but we work to prevent crime by, again, community education. So it is our safe community institute that focuses on adult education. And within our institute, we have four different programs. We have our victim services program, which uh, is a community for people that are going through probably the most difficult time in their life, right? Either they themselves have been a victim of some sort of violent crime or they have lost a family member to violent crime. Um, and so we have our Parents of Murdered Children, the Houston chapter, chapter falls under that program, um, as well as just support through the investigation, the trial process, parole, all of that. We have a podcast hosted by our CEO, Running Man Karios, called the Balanced Voice Podcast. If y'all are into true crime or just want some more information on all the different topics that we talk about, that is available on YouTube, Spotify, iTunes, anywhere you watch or listen to podcasts. And then, of course, our Glenda Gordy Research Center, making crime data easily accessible, easily understood. Um, the top categories we talk about are mainly violent crimes, homicides, aggravated assault, sexual assault, and a few others. Um, but all of that is available online on our website, our Glenda Gordy Research Center. So starting today's conversation on college safety with a video from our director, Sydney Zyker, our director of our Safe Community Institute, just kind of setting the stage, providing a little bit of context. College should be a fun and exciting time to learn new things and spend time with friends. Unfortunately, that time of expected excitement can be quickly interrupted due to crime or victimization. In 2022, crimes reported on college campuses rose significantly. With this in mind, Crime Stoppers of Houston now includes crimes on Texas college campuses and the data reported through our Glenda Gordy Research Center. In our analysis of 57 universities, our research center found that in 2022, there's been an 11% increase in aggravated assaults on college campuses, a 33% increase in theft on college campuses, and a 124% increase in rape cases reported on college campuses compared to the same reporting period last year. Our team has created this interactive resource packet specifically with you, college students, in mind. We hope this resource will provide you with added education, awareness, and resources about sexual assault, situational awareness, and mental health so that you may know how to mitigate victimization while in college. Special thank you to our two wonderful college students who currently work on our research center and who have made this information available to you today. Our director uh, talking about a lot of different things. As we talk about safety on the college campus, the main kind of buckets of crime that we're talking about are those that you see up there on your screen. So, um, and matter of fact, colleges are actually required to report on these crimes and a few others, uh, manslaughter, um, drug and weapon possessions are also kind of included in this, but these are the main ones that colleges kind of report on. And can you all guess what the most common crime on a college campus is in general? 
Absolutely. Absolutely sexual assault. In general, here at UHD, I was actually just looking at the crime log yesterday. It's mainly theft, but I would, I would guess that that's because this is mainly a commuter campus, right? You don't have a lot of students that are actually living on campus, and so you're not going to have a lot of opportunity for sexual assault, but I would imagine on a campus that is more residential, that's ab absolutely, absolutely where you're going to get your sexual assault. Um, and one of the more depressing statistics when it comes to crimes on college campuses is that we have seen actually a decrease in the rates of crime on college campuses with the exception of one. Can you all guess what that one is? Sexual assault, right? Not only has that one not gone down, it's actually increased, right? So these, these graphs that you see there on your screen, that line at the top, that is the total number or total rate of college or crimes on college campuses. Burglary used to be the more pop, the most common one. That has gone down. Something like a uh, motor vehicle theft has stayed relatively consistent, but you are seeing forcible sex offenses increase. Um, and so there is something going on that we have to address on college campuses. So over the course of today's presentation, I'll try to get you all out of here in an hour or less. 59 minutes, um, we're going to talk about these things, right? So Tisha did a wonderful job introducing sexual assault. I'm not going to linger on that too much, but I do want to talk about mental health, cyber safety, a little bit of substance use, situational awareness, and then safety planning, right? How can we create a plan for all of us, our friends, our classmates to be safe here on campus as we travel to and fro? So another video um, from our programs manager at Crime Stoppers, Caitlin Fry, and these videos are actually a part of a larger resource called our College Safety Brochure that, again, can send you if you would like. Though sexual assault is often classified as rape in Texas, sextortion, sexual harassment, fondling, and coercion are all additional forms of victimization that fall into this category. Approximately 90% of sexual assault cases go unreported, and rape cases alone on Texas college campuses more than doubled in 2022 over the same reporting period the previous year. There were 21 reported rape cases on Texas college campuses in 2021 and 47 reported rape cases from January to September 2022. Imagine what the numbers would look like if all sexual assaults on college campuses were reported. College is about far more than simply academics. Networking and socializing are also important components of cultivating your life as a young adult. Much of your time in college is spent building relationships, forming friendships, and engaging in new experiences. During this time, you may be faced with situations in which you or a friend may feel unsafe for a variety of reasons. Experimentation with substances can exasperate opportunities for victimization, such as sexual assault. The term sexual assault specifically refers to sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent from the victim. At 17 in the state of Texas, you become of legal age to give consent. However, that changes when substances are involved. Consent cannot legally be given if one or both parties are under the influence. Consent plays a vital role in any form of intimacy and must be conveyed via verbal or physical cues. According to Rain, Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, eight out of 10 sexual assault incidents are committed by someone known to the victim. 33% of which are committed by a current or former dating partner, and 39% of which are committed by an acquaintance or friend. Having a relationship with your attacker and then being a part of your social circle can make reporting even more difficult. Whether wanting to get help for yourself or someone else, it's not always easy to step in. Com a little bit short right there because I think Caitlin just gave us a lot there to talk about. So. Piggybacking off Tisha's conversation on consent, again, just a little bit, consent and coercion. So we know consent, number one, has to be freely given. If I am coercing somebody into saying yes, they didn't want to say yes. They're doing it because they fear for their safety. They're tired of me bugging them, right? That is not a freely given yes. Consent is reversible, right? I have the right to change my mind at any time. Just because I said yes five minutes ago, something could have happened, and I'm in a completely different mind space, right? So my partner has to honor and respect that. It's informed and specific. I know exactly what I'm saying yes to, right? My partner isn't changing up the activity or the expectations in the middle, right? Or at least if there is a change up, there's open and honest communication. But I know exactly what I'm saying yes or no to. And consent can be given verbally or physically. But I think 
relying solely on body language can get us in a lot of trouble, right? A story about a friend of mine, I promise it is a friend of mine, I'm not just saying a friend of mine, but a friend of mine in college um, was dating this young lady when they were freshmen, right? They went out, got drinks, whatever, came back to their dorm, were intimate. This same friend, um, our senior year, came to me and said, hey, this young lady that I had hooked up with freshman year is now saying that our... I'm going to use the word sex, right? Because I think we have to destigmatize the word sex. So when we had sex, right, she felt coerced into doing it. And that was jarring for him because he was being accused of rape, right? Non-consensual sexual activity. And that was hard for him to understand because he understood rape as something completely different, right? It's, 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 it's violent. It's you're taking something. But he, in that moment, felt like his partner was agreeing to that. And so that was really hard for him to reckon with. And so... I think there has to be a larger conversation, particularly amongst men, about what consent actually looks like. I think there is the misconception that um, whether we're pursuing men, pursuing women, right, that there is, you have you have to chase it, right? You don't want somebody that says yes too early is, is kind of the thinking that a lot of men get, right? You want somebody who you have to keep pestering and keep chasing. But I think that is what leads to coercion. That is what leads to women or whomever just eventually saying yes because they're just tired of this dude bugging them, right? So we have to have a conversation about how to respectfully get consent and how to respond if that person says no because a lot of men (laughs) cannot handle rejection well, right? They react very violently to being embarrassed, to being told no, right? And so there has to be a much larger conversation around consent amongst men, right? Um, coercion, right? Again, consent that is not freely given. So whether it's your partner using force or intimidation, threats, there's a weapon in the room, right? Saying things like, oh, well, Timmy and his girl are hooking up all the time. What's wrong? What's wrong with us? Why can't we do it? Right? Making you think that there was something wrong with you or the relationship. Persistent attempts, right? Everybody else does it. There are certain, and it's like, um, it's like scripts, right? There are, we're going to hear different examples of these all the time. Caitlin in her video also mentioned what's called sextortion. So this is a definition taken directly from the FBI. The FBI, uh, NICMIC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, as well as a number of other law enforcement agencies, report a rise in what's being called sextortion. So this is the definition up here on your screen. It says um, younger than 18, trying to convince a person that's younger than 18, but we are seeing adults of all ages also getting caught up in this, right? It's when somebody sends an intimate, private, sensitive picture or video to somebody that they're dating or flirting with or talking to, and then that person turns around and and blackmails them with those pictures, saying, hey, unless you send me money or send me more pictures or meet up with me in person, right, I'm sending these to your friends, your family, the entire school. Some, again, pretty terrifying statistics for you. We have seen that a large swath of the victims are young boys, right, 14 to 17 years old. And I don't know, I think this is because when we talk to children about being cautious online and not sending pictures, I think that message gets across to young ladies pretty well, but I think guys are less cautious with (laughs) the the pictures that a lot of them send. I think the fact that we have... uh, (laughs) A, a crisis of unsolicited dick pic, excuse me, penis pictures, right? I think that, I, I just looked up, I'm sorry. Um, that I think shows that I think men are a lot more willing to sh- show kind of sensitive images of themselves, right? And it starts at a young age. Um, between 2019 and 2021, the pandemic, right? The number of reports involving sextortion more than doubled. As all of us, including kids, were on their phones more, right, they were exposed to more online predators. The FBI estimates there's 500,000 predators online every day. (laughs) That number seems kind of low to me. I don't know. Um, But we are seeing the effects of that, the effects of all of us being forced online and maybe not necessarily having the guidance and the support to do it in a healthy and safe way. More than 80% of teenagers have encountered nudity or sexual content online. So by the time folks come to college, they have absolutely seen pornography, probably. They have seen naked bodies on the Internet. We are being exposed to this at younger and younger ages. When we talk to elementary schoolers about what they're seeing online, right, a lot of them are being sent these things or they're just popping up on their feeds or they're accidentally seeing it, right? It's happening at younger and younger ages. 
being exposed to pornography at like third, fourth, fifth grade. 60% of online victims were threatened within two weeks of initial contact, right? So these predators, they are not wasting any time, right? This is their, this is their full-time job almost, right? They are experts at finding their victim, targeting their victim, and manipulating and getting the most out of their victim in a really quick um, way. Because, again, they're trying to make some money or, or, manip or meet up with somebody or just manipulate somebody in some sort of way. And this one at the bottom, amongst young Kids, amongst children that have shared their own nudes, which is just a jarring sense in the first place, right? Amongst children who have shared their own nudes, 43% admit that they have shared them with somebody that they did not know in real life, right? So somebody that they meet online that was either catfishing them, pretending to be a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or somebody that they knew from jump wasn't uh, a child but still wanted to interact with them in some sort of way online. And so our kids are seeing porn online, they are engaging in sexual activity online, and a lot of them are being blackmailed for that sexual activity online, which is leading to, goodness, um, suicide, right? And feelings of anxiety, not feeling safe at home or at school or on the internet. So to confront and, and deal with cases of sex extortion, right? It really starts with prevention. And I think there is a really careful balance to draw between crime prevention and victim blaming, right? Because when we talk about the things that you could have or should have done to keep yourself safe, we don't want to shame people for being a victim of crime. But I think it's also important that we let people know there are things that you can do to keep yourself safe. So it starts with cyber safety, having private accounts, right? Having um, rules around do we talk to strangers? Do we send pictures to people that we don't know, right? If we are being blackmailed or extorted or sextorted, it is really important that we do not comply, right? That we do not give that predator, that groomer, what they want, because that's just going to lead to them asking for more and more things. It is incredibly important that we do not talk to them at all. We can block them. We can report them, which I'll talk about here in a second, but stop responding, right? Stop all communication. Because the more that we communicate with that person that is trying to extort or blackmail us, the more ways they'll try to find to, to take advantage of us. If it's happening online, whether it's happening on Instagram or TikTok or wherever, right, we need to report that user on that platform because odds are if they are harassing you, they're harassing somebody else, right? You are probably not their only victim. So it's really important to report that user. We might be able to get their account suspended, taken down, whatever the kind of resolution is, but reporting that user online and then telling somebody in real life, right? So either somebody here, if it's another classmate that's abusing you, uh, we'll talk about Title IX here in a second, um, but tell somebody in real life so that they can help you through that as well. And then there is a way to remove uh, explicit non-consensual images from the internet. It's called takeitdown.org or .com or .net, I forget what the little suffix is at the end, but take it down will help you uh, remove those images from social media platforms, especially if they are uh, images of people under the age of 18. Crucial point here uh, at the corner that I almost forgot, right? Do not delete any of the threatening messages or blackmail messages that somebody is sending you because that's your proof, right? That's your evidence that somebody is harassing me. So, and it may be our first impulse. We might feel really ashamed. We might panic in that moment. Oh no, somebody got these pictures and they're threatening to share everybody. I'm going to delete everything, right? That might be our first kind of impulse. But it's really important that we preserve evidence because if and when we do decide to report either the campus police or HPD, right, that's our proof right there. So making sure that we save messages, screenshot, any and everything. And when we come back to prevention, right, knowing how to spot a fake profile in the first place, right? So something about this account seems off, right? Tisha talked a little bit about trusting our gut. We might get a fin request or a follow request from somebody that we know oh, this isn't real. <laughs> this is either a bot or it's somebody that made this account two hours ago, right? So there are some things that we can spot to let us know that this person may not be legitimate. So it is an unclear, blurred, or stock profile picture, somebody intentionally trying to hide their identity. Incomplete profile information. Again, somebody didn't create this profile with the intention of actually and authentically engaging with people on social media. They created it to manipulate, lie, and deceive. They didn't care about filling out a bio. They don't care about all that, any of that other stuff. Limited side activity, 
Um, inconsistent information. If they say that they are 22 in their bio, but they start talking to you and they say, oh, I'm 26, right? Inconsistent information. A uh, few friends and interactions. Again, they are not creating this profile to actually engage with folks online. They created this profile to, um, again, lie and deceive and manipulate, requesting personal information or sexual information too soon. Suspicious profile name. So if it says Tom and then a whole bunch of numbers, right? Again, that's either a bot or, again, somebody who just wasn't putting that much effort into their online profile. And the profile is full of inappropriate or sexual content or, again, just things that are artificial. Memes, stock photos, right? All of that. So next video from... Maintaining a strong and positive mental well-being is crucial to staying safe. When we talk about mental health, we're not only talking about our different emotions and moods, think sadness, anger, fear, happiness, but we're also talking about our decision-making, our social relationships, our self-esteem, how we handle stress, and so much more. Simply, our mental health includes how we think, how we act, and how we feel. When someone is going through a mental health crisis, their emotional responses to certain situations may become irrational. They may lash out aggressively at minor frustrations or become completely overwhelmed by small inconveniences. People may turn to drugs, alcohol, or other, other risky behaviors as a coping mechanism if they're going through stressful life events. Excessive and constant stress can lead to burnout and the inability to function. Burnout can leave people feeling overloaded, exhausted, helpless, and unappreciated. As a college student, mental health should be a primary concern. Paying for classes and textbooks, completing all assignments on time, building relationships with classmates and professors, advancing your career, all of these stressors put immense pressure on a college student, and it can be difficult to navigate. We're gonna talk about a few skills you can begin practicing. Don't cut him off right there. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about some, some signs of mental health crises, and let's start with depression, right? How can you tell somebody's depressed? What might be some signs or symptoms that somebody is, is going through a depression? Maybe that you have seen in yourself, in a classmate, in a friend, in a family member. Okay, stop engaging. Yeah, so either socially or with other clubs or organizations. Christian? Yeah, so a, a steep and sudden decline in grades, right? Yes, sir, I will. So our friend Tisha said one way that you can tell is a steep and sudden decline in somebody's grades. If somebody is usually uh, an A-plus student, but then suddenly they are missing assignments, missing quizzes, missing tests, right? That might be a sign. Um, somebody that is no longer engaged in the things that they typically find joy in, whether it's basketball or flag football or knitting, cooking, whatever it is, right? They are disengaging from their hobbies and from their friends and family. What else? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So our friend said um, somebody that's constantly on their phone, whether they are just kind of mindlessly scrolling or playing games to try to escape whatever they're feeling or, or just cope with it. Absolutely. Maybe one or two more. How can you tell somebody might be feeling depressed? Lack of energy. Absolutely. And then you had a thought. So changes in energy and changes in appetite. Um, I'll tell y'all, for me, whenever I, <coughs> goodness, I've had, I've actually had to have a friend, some, some friends have some like mental health interventions with me. It was in college and probably my, the worst depression of my life. And it was those two things, really. It was the lack of appetite um, and the loss of energy. So I actually had the friend say, and this, this like intervention, this conversation that you have to have sometimes might be what saves somebody's life, right? If you go up to them and you say, okay, Joshua, dog, you haven't eaten a full meal in a week. Um, you've been kind of irritable, and I haven't seen you leave your bedroom in five days. Is everything okay? And just identifying those things for that person might help them understand that, actually, no, I'm not okay. Because we can, it's hard, I'll speak for myself, right? It can be hard for me to know what I'm feeling sometimes. Um, but having somebody identify the things that are concerning them goes a long way for helping me address whatever I'm dealing with. 
Um, so this is a, a nice script to have. If you think that somebody might be going through a crisis, if you think that somebody might actually be to the point of being suicidal. So letting them know that they are your priority. Picking a time and a place that is comfortable for them to have that conversation. <laughs> because asking somebody about like the depths of their mental health is a very difficult conversation. And so making sure that they are in a comfortable place um, when we're doing it. So some people, we might need to take a walk while we're having that conversation to get the nerves and the jitters out, right? For some of us, we might not be able to hold direct eye contact when we're talking about our, our traumas and our triggers. So finding a way for that person to be comfortable as you are having that very difficult conversation. Share your concern, right? I notice that you're not eating, your energy is weird, your mood is off, right? Is everything okay? You haven't seen yourself lately. Ask if there is a specific trigger, right? Was there a test that they didn't do well on or their internship for this semester isn't working out, right? Is there something going on at home, right? Is, there, is everything okay? Was there a specific trigger that set you off? Is there a plan that we can create together to help you through the situation? Even if I can't help you build that plan, let's go find somebody that can. There are mental health experts on this campus. There are life experts on this campus. Even if I don't have the skills, we can find somebody together that does. And then knowing our limits, right? Again, I'm not a uh, psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I don't have the expertise, the ability to diagnose anybody, but I can help you through it, and I can point you to somebody that can. So knowing our limits, knowing what resources are available here on campus, but also in the city at large. One really cool tool that I always like to share, uh, you can do mental health screens on social media. So again, I. Don't use this tool to diagnose yourself, um, but as a general screen to see, I've been feeling kind of off these last couple days, these last couple years, right? Let me see if I'm feeling maybe depressed or maybe I'm anxious or maybe I'm dealing with some PTSD or some sort of disordered eating, right? All of that can be kind of figured out using this health screen from, I believe it's Mental Health America. Um, so if anybody wants to grab that, I'll pause here and see some folks do that. So moving a little bit into substance use, because number one, substance use disorder is a recognized mental health disorder. So we need to be having this conversation around substance use as we're talking about mental health, but also just as we are talking on a college campus. We know that substances, whether it's caffeine, whether it's alcohol, whether it's tobacco, whether it's marijuana, right? We are seeing all of those and so many more things on college campuses. So a quick little quiz for you. Let's see who can get the most right. True or false? Possession of a THC vape, a vape with marijuana that gets you high, is a felony in Texas. True or false? Okay, so we had a few people say false initially, but then we had a, a chorus come in and say true. Um, I'll give you all the answers on the next slide, but keep these in mind. So, no, question number two, one in how many college students experience academic problems due to drinking? What do y'all think that, that ratio is? One in how many students? I heard 50, I heard three, I heard five, I heard 10, I heard two, okay. <laughs> Question number three, approximately what percentage of full-time college students meet the criteria for an alcohol use disorder? How many college students could be diagnosed as alcoholics? You said 35, okay. <laughs> okay, 35, that's our strong, strongest guess, 45, okay. Question number four, around what percentage of college students use marijuana in 2018? 75, 72? <laughs> um, yep, and last one, question number five, just, okay, how much fentanyl is enough to cause a lethal overdose? Dustin, yeah, very small amount. Does anybody know maybe the exact amount or the wager is what? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, answers for you. It is true. So, possession of a THC vape is a felony in Texas. Possession of nicotine is legal if you're of age, but having a THC vape at all, THC, what's it called, oil, um, is a felony in Texas. 
one in four college students experience academic problems due to drinking. So whether it's being hungover, whether it's being, they're spending all of their time and money on drinking so they can't afford school supplies, whatever it is. Approximately 9% of full-time college students uh, can be diagnosed as, we should probably not use the word alcoholics, but somebody with an alcohol use disorder. Um, around 43% of college students use marijuana in 2018, I guess. Um, that, I don't know, that might be a little low, whatever. Um, it depends, it, okay, yeah, it depends on the state, depends on the campus, depends on who's reporting, if you're just doing self-report, you know. Um, lastly, just two milligrams, two milligrams of fentanyl is enough to be a lethal overdose. That's, that's two grains of salt, right? So it's, uh, it's like an eighth of a penny, right? It takes the smallest amount to, uh, to die from a opioid, or excuse me, fentanyl overdose. Fentanyl is an opioid. Um, so I will show a short video on how to use Narcan. Has anybody heard of Narcan before? Okay, so Narcan is the nasal spray that you can use to reverse an opioid overdose. Fentanyl is an opioid, as is morphine and a few other things. I forget, I should probably know. But this is a video on what Narcan is and how to use it in an emergency. Naloxone is a rescue medication that temporarily blocks the effects of opioids during an overdose. The first thing to know, according to Mayo Clinic's Dr. Holly Geyer, is how to use it on someone having an overdose, even if they're unconscious. You're going to put that person on their side in the recovery position, make sure that your surroundings are safe, and then administer it by just putting it inside the nostril and giving it a squeeze. Naloxone temporarily blocks the effects of an opioid. Naloxone goes through the bloodstream straight to that part of the brain, knocks off the opioid from that receptor, binds to it, and prevents the opioid from having an effect. Next, remember naloxone's effects are temporary and may last only minutes. Calling 911 is critical. It is always a medical emergency if naloxone is given. Call 911 right away. For the Mayo Clinic News Network, I'm Marty Velasco Haynes. Okay, cool. So, one of the resources that uh, I brought for you all at that far table is our Drugs in a Snap booklet. That Drugs in a Snap booklet talks naloxone. about how a young child named Sam Berman uh, bought some sort of pills on Snapchat. You can buy drugs on Snapchat, by the way, if you guys didn't know. No, don't do it. But as a, as a precautionary message, um, Sammy bought, it was probably just like Adderall or something, um, and it, ended, it was laced with fentanyl, and Sammy ended up passing away. Um, and so that Drugs in a Snap booklet talks about how to First of all, understand the signs of an opioid overdose, how to monitor social media platforms, keep an eye on what kids are doing, um, as well as how to use Narcan, how to get involved with certain legislation. That is all in that Drugs and Snap booklet on that far table. But we also need to talk about how to even recognize an opioid overdose in the first place. I got asked that question last time that we did this presentation. I didn't have an answer, but I have an answer now. I Googled these. So uh, <laughs> how you can tell somebody might be having an opioid overdose slow shallow breathing so they're not taking full deep breaths they might be unconscious limp arms limp legs discoloration right so pale flushed skin um, lack of circulation in the extremities so fingertips lips um, faint heartbeat vomiting dilated pupils right all of these if you see these in somebody that would probably be the time to use narcan if you have it if you don't have it and would like some crime stoppers has some that we can give you all for free right just Either email me, my business card is up there as well, and I'd be happy to come drop some off for you. So knowing how to use Narcan, spot an opioid overdose to, again, save lives. We have seen fentanyl overdoses um, just skyrocket here in the last few years, so just some more general knowledge that we all need. Last video. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please. Yes. Yes, so our friend asked, is uh, Narcan available at pharmacies? Pharmacies, goodness gracious. Yes, it is at pharmacies. I don't know what a pharmacy is. Um, but it is at pharmacies. It was actually just recently approved for over-the-counter um, sale. So it should be available at CVS's, Walgreens. Um, and again, if it isn't, Crime Stoppers has some for you. The cost, I'm not sure. Let me see. Caesars, as a part of an opioid overdose. Okay, I'll have to add that one, yeah. Um, so this last video talks about situational awareness. Our, he has a new title, our statewide uh, safe school manager, Ernesto Reyes, talking about situational awareness. 
A perpetrator decides if you are an easy target within seven seconds of seeing you. Whether you're heading to class, home, or for a night out, situational awareness is something we can all practice regularly. Actively doing so can help ensure that you are best prepared for all kinds of emergencies, like a robbery, an assault, or even a campus shooting. In 2022, thus far, there have been 225 burglaries on Texas college campuses, which is a 32% increase over 2021. Additionally, there have been 2,448 cases of theft on college campuses, making this a 33% increase of theft over 2021. And finally, there have been 951 cases of aggravated assaults on college campuses so far this year in Texas, which is an 11% increase over the same reporting period of 2021. Being situationally aware means that you are always conscious of your environment, and you have an action plan to respond quickly in a crisis. There are a few things to consider in creating your own personal safety plan. Increasing consciousness of your surroundings is an important first step in creating a safety plan. Scan your environment to determine what potential dangers exist and how you might be able to flee any given environment if needed. Identify all exits, including unexpected ones, such as an exit in the kitchen of a restaurant or a back door at a music venue. Make a deliberate plan for what you would do if someone approached you in an attempt to rob or assault you and what you would do in the event of a mass shooting. In any of these situations, remember that removing yourself is the safest option to avoid victimization. But if there is no option to leave, the next best option is to hide. If there is a mass shooting event, think of where you could hide and make a plan for what you would do to barricade yourself if needed. What heavy object could you slide in front of a door and how would you position yourself to give you the best opportunity to defend yourself if needed? Making sure to stand behind the hinge of a door gives you more opportunity to fight back if it comes to that. And finally, give yourself permission to fight back and practice doing so. Although it sounds silly, actually practicing yelling stop or get back, as well as practicing how to use personal safety tools creates pathways in your brain that makes it easier for your body to spring into action in a crisis. Lastly, prepare yourself by acquiring any tools or skills you need to increase your ability and knowledge to defend yourself if needed. Take a self-defense class, purchase a personal safety tool to carry with you at all times, participate in an active shooter training, and identify what resources your campus has to aid you in your quest for safety. Many campuses have programs that will aid you in getting home safely, by providing an escort to walk you back to your dorm or apartment after a late night of studying or hanging out with friends. Contact your campus police department to inquire about programs such as these. All of these things will make you much better prepared in any kind of emergency. If you'd like to learn more about situational awareness or how to attend a self-defense class, please visit our website at crimestoppers.com dot org slash resource dash center. Ernesto Reyes um, talking a lot about situational awareness. So he said a lot of great things there, number one. Um, having the mindset and the skill set to be able to respond in emergencies, right? It's not just about thinking through and visualizing what you would do. You have to give yourself permission to be violent in, in the worst kind of situation. So let's, let's kind of put ourselves there for a moment. Right, say somebody comes into this building looking to do harm, right? They have some sort of weapon. What do we do? Okay. So your first thought would be to barricade the door. Okay. Does this is this door locked from the outside? Okay. So that's a great thing there, first of all, is having this door locked from the outside. But is this one? This one we can't lock. Okay. Do we know if is that outside door locked? Okay. 
So knowing that if somebody were to come into this building, right, they are, unless they are taking down that door, um, they would have to come in through here. Um, so that means we could probably escape through that way. Does anybody know where exiting out these doors is going to lead us? Commerce Street, right outside. Okay. Because it's, not imp it's important to not only know where the exits are, but where those exits lead. Um, we were doing an active shooter presentation at a church not too long ago. And at the pulpit at the front of the church, there was a door on either side. And I asked that same question, right? Say somebody were to come in with a weapon, what would you do? Where would you go? And they said, oh, we would just go to either one of those doors. And pastor was like, hold on, wait, whoa. If you go out that door, that'll take you out to the front and you'll be safe, you'll be cool. But if you go out this door, that'll take you around the back of the building to a fenced off area where you'll be trapped, right? So it's not enough to only know where the exits are, but where they lead and where you're going to kind of pop out on the other side. Um, okay. My friend, can I pick on you for real quick? No? Okay, I appreciate the honesty. No, I cannot. Thank you. Um, is there somebody that I can, I can ask a few questions to kind of put you on the spot? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay, so say you are walking home, walking to your car after a, a long night on campus, right? And as you're walking to your car, you get a weird feeling that somebody is following you. What do you do? Okay, so you're going to kind of check, kind of get an understanding of your surroundings, but then you're going to kind of start high-stepping. Okay, um, what if that person kind of keeps pace with you? You speed up, they speed up. What do you do then? So she is 50-50 split. She, half of her wants to call somebody, say, hey, there's some weird person following me, just kind of want to keep them updated. And then, I forget, what was the, what was the other one? Okay. And so the other half of her would say, hey, <laughs> man, dude, are you okay? Why are you following me? Is there anything I can help you with? Okay. Uh, does that make you, yes, ma'am? Not, oh, I'm sorry, uh, and not very much in terms of activity. So I just ran into the street yelling no, when I probably should have just thrown my purse at him and, and you know. And uh, I thought someone would, I saw a car coming, and I thought someone would uh, stop, because there's a woman standing in the middle of the street, screaming and, and, and holding her purse like this. Yeah. But they kept going. So. Yeah, so it's a it's a hard thing. So I just started running just that. Yeah, but I would I would think that you did the right thing in trying to draw as much attention to you as possible because I think that is what we have to do. If somebody is following us on the street looking to attack us, they are trying to get us in a situation where we are alone and isolated, right? Get us cornered, get us in an alley somewhere. And so trying to draw attention, yelling as loud as we can, stop, get back, sir, I don't know you, what are you doing, right? All of these things to draw attention to our situation and help keep us safe. Um, again, having a personal protection tool, so whatever that is for you, whether it's mace, whether it is a taser, whether it's a firearm, a knife, right? Not only having it, but being familiar enough to use it effectively. You don't want to pull out the pepper spray and have it facing the wrong way. So right, being able to use it effectively to keep yourself safe and stop yourself from being hurt in the process. When it comes to an active attacker, whether it's a mass shooter, somebody with a knife entering the building, you're kind of, this is the stop, drop, and roll of, of, of active shooter, right? Run, hide, fight. Your first plan should be to get out of there as quickly as possible, right? You can't be a victim of a crime if you're not where the crime is happening. So get out as quickly as you can. If you can't, hide, right? Barricade doors, lock doors, lower shades, turn off the lights, put our phones on vibrate, right? Because if a family member or friend gets a notification from K-H-O-U, that there is a shooting on UHD, God forbid, right? They might call or text us to make sure that we're okay. But that call or text, if our phone isn't on vibrate, might give our location away. So making sure that we silence our phones. And on the flip side, right, if we see that a loved one is in a location where there's an active attack, 
as much as we want to check in on them, right? Making sure that we can protect their safety. So wait until we see that there's an all clear because we don't want to be the reason that their location is given away, right? So making sure phones are on silent and then if we have to fight, right? So having made the decision that if my life comes down to it, I am willing to put a pair of scissors in somebody's throat, right? Or crack somebody over the head with a fire extinguisher. Do whatever I have to do to keep myself alive because it may come down to that, literally life or death. So being willing to do what you need to do. Okay, thank you. So to kind of re rephrase, being down here at UHD, right? Y'all are kind of right here in the thick of it. You have folks from all over, all over the world in this city, but people from all over the city in this kind of unique location people that have some sort of very severe need, right? Maybe they need shelter, food, water, and so they come into the building looking for those things, but in doing that, put y'all at risk because you don't know who these people are, right? They're not students, they're not staff, they're not faculty, they're not, um, you can't like kick them out of class, right? There are no like real consequences besides arrest for these people, right? And so how can we keep this building in this campus safe is what I'm hearing. You, you said you had four different incidents since Friday? Yeah. OK, so just kind of echoing the concerns of having to park far away late at night. Right. And at that point, there are less people on campus to kind of keep an eye out for each other. Staff and faculty might have gone home. We'll still we still have the officers, thankfully, but it's just a lot more dangerous. And so what do we do with that? Right. I hear you guys saying that you have started advocating for yourselves. Right. I think that is huge. So maybe is there a way to get that staff parking lot open at night once all staff is gone just so y'all can park closer, right? Is there a way to build in or advocate for changes in policies at the university level to make sure that we are staying safe? Um, also on a personal level, right? We can do kind of macro, right? But we can also do personal, having a personal protection tool, whether it's a big heavy water bottle, uh, keys between the fingers, there are certain steps that we can take to protect ourselves. Um, but I would say in terms of like the most significant change would probably happen at a university level. So getting, I don't, do y'all have the blue lights out here? Okay, so it sounds like there are some material things that can be done at a university level to make y'all feel safer. And so that might be one of my strongest suggestions is to do some sort of advocacy for yourselves. Um, having blue lights right, right, Everywhere on campus, if they're not here, put them here. If there are other parts of campus where y'all don't have them, get those there as well. I have to be careful. Um, yeah, I would say do what you can to make sure that the university hears your concerns. Um, because I, I, I would assume that the safety of the students would be a top priority. Um, it should be. Yeah. And so kind of making that loud. We feel unsafe. We are hoping that class gets canceled. Sometimes we're not even coming to class because we feel unsafe. Um, I, I think, yeah, making those concerns, I'm sure that you all have made those concerns known, but keep doing it. Um, and then, of course, on the personal, doing whatever you can on a personal level to keep yourself safe. Um, yeah, that's the, I, that's, that's the best I got. Um, yes, sir. OK. Absolutely. So there is a, a group advocacy effort. There is a, a group me that can be used to kind of build a coalition, but then also working on a letter to get that sent up to people that can make decisions. Um, so if you want that information, our friend in the green shirt has that. Can you please remind me of your name? Alexandria, Alexandria has that information. Um, so walking out here at night during the day, right, we may witness some sort of weird, violent situation. And in those moments, to our comfort level being an upstander, right? Being an active bystander intervening. So it starts with assessing the situation. What's going on, right? Is it two people arguing? What are they arguing about? Is it about money? Is it about a parking spot? Is it about to get violent, right? Is there somebody that's in danger here, including myself, right? If I decide to get involved in this situation, am I putting myself in more danger? So that's step one, assess the situation. Call for help, step two. If we decide that it's too dangerous for us, right, calling police, calling campus security to get them involved. If we need to create a distraction, right, disrupt whatever is currently going on, whether it's uh, a guy being really aggressive to, to a woman walking down the street or people fighting, arguing, whatever it is, right, creating a distraction. 
if we need to do some sort of direct intervention, approaching the victim, saying, hey, are you okay? It seems like this person is being very violent, being very aggressive. Do you want to, do you want me to walk you to your car? Do you need me to call somebody for you, right? Offering direct support and then documenting and reporting. So if taking pictures, taking videos, calling the police after the fact, um, just so that there is a report and somebody knows what happened. Going to end with hazing. Yeah, this is the last thing we'll talk about this morning, this afternoon, actually. Hazing. So hazing, any activity expected of somebody joining a group that humiliates, degrades, abuses, and endangers them. Uh, one common defense that we hear is this, oh, this person consented to it. They said yes, they were okay with it the whole time. Um, that is not a defense, right? According to UHD's own policy on hazing, consent is not a defense because the idea is that this person only said yes because they wanted to join this group so bad. It's the same thing as sexual coercion, right? You were holding this thing above them and saying that the only way that you're going to get this is by going through these different things, right? So it doesn't matter if we are directing the hazing activities ourselves, if we are encouraging, aiding it, even just failing to report, right, can put us in a very dangerous situation. And matter of fact, it is a misdemeanor. It is we can go to jail for hazing, right? Um, and if there is bodily injury kind of caused over the course of hazing, it becomes an even more severe crime. So just knowing that it applies to events both on campus and off campus, and it looks a lot of different ways. So this graphic was taken from stophazing.com or stophazing.org, and it shows how there are some forms of hazing that are easier to recognize that may seem more common. Um, but those are the ones that are happening a little bit less frequently. It's the ones that are harder to spot, right? Harder to identify that are happening a lot more often. So it's things like lying to somebody or um, using demeaning names, right? Um, um, skits, uh, embarrassing clothing, sleep deprivation, having them out in the elements, right? All of these things that are a prerequisite for joining some sort of organization, whether it be fraternity, sorority, sports team, other kind of club or organization. Uh, but this is actually the last thing we'll talk about. Title IX, right, anti-sexual discrimination law applies to all, all schools that receive federal funding. Schools have a legal obligation to investigate all reports of sexual harassment, sexual discrimination, right? So if we need to issue a no contact order, which means that person can't contact you, can't be within the same proximity as you, suspending, expelling that student, right? But there is a Title IX coordinator here on this campus, Ms. Lori Ruiz. Her contact information is there on your screen. If you need to contact her for any reason, right, that is the person that you would go to. I'll pause here for a few seconds. Uh, if anybody wants to take a picture of Lori's info. Ending with some resources for you. If you need a uh, sexual assault forensic exam, the Forensic Center of Excellence is a resource as well as DIA. Council on Recovery Montrose Center. Uh, Tisha mentioned loveisrespect.org, another one of those sites that I also really like when it comes to healthy relationships, red flags to look out for, re other resources. Reporting, there is a way to report con or student incident student conduct incidents here on campus, but I think it's really important to remember that this form may be shared with other students, right? So if you are talking about something potentially very sensitive that happened on campus and you are concerned about that information being shared, that is why Crime Stoppers exists, right? We are a completely anonymous tip line. Nobody's gonna know that you reported unless you tell them yourself. And if your tip helps us solve a crime or locate a fugitive that we're looking for, you can also earn up to $5,000 of a cash reward. So um, with that, you all, I say thank you so much. Thank you all for showing up, for attending, for being engaged. Please feel free to grab some of the extra food there on the side table. We have plenty of handouts for everybody. Um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, guys.